the things that really draws our heart towards King David is he's really relatable. There's these really high highs and then these really low lows. We go through these seasons in which it feels like the Lord is completely Lord of our lives as much as we know how. And then we enter into these dry seasons where we can kind of agree with David when he says things like, how long, O Lord, will you forsake me? Or where are you? Or I'm thirsty for you. I'm hungry for you. You start to get a sense from David that he's confused at what's happening. And you can feel in him what so many of us have felt when we've experienced these trials. Wait, where is God in the middle of this? King David is saying, and I can affirm from my own suffering, when I was laid sick with chemo, laying on the bathroom floor, one of the first places that we find a warm blanket for a weary soul is in the promises of God. You see this desire to be used by God coming out of the soul of King David. He doesn't want to just settle for darkness reigning and ruling across the world. What should be driving us forward on mission as believers in Christ is not just hatred towards the world, but really love to see the world come under the Lordship of Christ and begin to flourish. Christian, you should never be bored. Your workplace, your neighborhood, wherever we are, we've been uniquely wired and uniquely placed for the purpose of mission. The story of the Bible is the story of God working in the mess. God is ever present and God carries his people through. As we walk through Psalm 119, we're seeing a shadow of what is to come in the person and work of Jesus Christ. morning. I want to welcome you here this morning. Welcome to Discovery Church. We exist to proclaim the gospel and to equip people to become wholehearted followers of Christ, and we are thrilled to welcome you this morning, and we pray that it is an encouraging morning for you and your family. So uh, a couple of announcements I want to get out of the way, and then uh, then we will begin to uh, worship together. First of all would be the, the video that uh, was just playing now as an advertisement for the women's uh, afternoon Bible study that's going to start on August 11th. So August 11th, that's a Friday at 1 in the afternoon in the annex of the building here is a new women's Bible study on Psalm 119. And so all gals at Discovery are invited uh, to attend that, and that starts on August 11th. Um, sooner than that, we have a fellowship event f as a church coming up this Wednesday at Riverside Park at 6 p.m. Uh, we're going to gather, we're going to bring some snacks, uh, share some fellowship time, and we are going to launch water rockets. Okay, so if you don't know what a water rocket is, then you should come and find out. So uh, kids, come and, uh, come ready for that. Families bring snacks. We'll have fellowship. Maybe uh, maybe if you even bring something to roast over a fire, we'll get a fire going and uh, roast marshmallows or something like that. So that'll be a time of fellowship and conversation around some fun for the kids, and we invite you to attend that with us. Uh, the following week, uh, small groups will resume until we start our fall program uh, on Wednesday nights. Uh, immediately after the service today, there's a praise, prayer, and update meeting, and that is uh, happening while we have our potluck. So everyone's invited to stay for potluck if you want to stay and uh, fellowship with us for that. But then uh, immediately after the potluck, there will be a church meeting, a, a prayer, praise, and update meeting. And if you are a member or a regular attender here at Discovery Church, um, we ask you to actually prioritize those because those are one of the main ways that we are working on keeping ourselves updated as a church, uh, praying together, and making sure we're talking about what the Lord is doing in our midst. And so we ask you to prioritize that uh, if you are able. And then the last thing I want to hit on is that our rummage sale is coming up. Uh, so we are, um, we are less than two weeks away from the rummage sale that's happening on the 10th, 11th, and 12th of, of August. And uh, we would love anybody who is interested in helping us organize that and get that all, get all those items priced, um, get all those items organized and displayed in our 
coffee shop area. We're expecting it to be pretty busy, and our garage is already a mess full of stuff that has been generously donated. And, uh, and so there is a sign-up sheet at the welcome desk back here. And so we would ask for you, if you're interested at all in taking any time in the next couple of weeks to come in and price some stuff or when it gets time to set it all up in there to help us organize that, that would be greatly, greatly appreciated. And so please sign up at the welcome desk to help us with the rummage sale. Um, with that, uh, we want to do every introvert's favorite thing right now, which is stand and greet one another, and then we're going to get to worship. Let's greet one another. Just stand and shake hands. We want to read scripture, and then in that scripture, we want the Lord to summon us to worship. So the call to worship today is from the book of Acts, chapter 2, starting in verse 17. This is the word of God. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Would you pray with me? Our Father and God, uh, this is true that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You are a good and gracious and kind God to reveal to us that name, the name of Jesus. And so in the name of Jesus, we come to you. And in the name of Jesus, we praise you. And in the name of Jesus, we magnify what you've done in Christ on this earth for the salvation of all who call. And so we pray now that you be honored.
There's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. This is my revelation, Christ Jesus crucified. Salvation through repentance at the cross on which he died. Now hear my absolution. Forgiveness for my sin. And I sink beneath the waters that Christ was buried in. I will rise, I will rise as Christ was raised to life.
baptisms, and we actually get to do two more next week as well, so it's going to be an encouraging uh, couple of weeks. Uh, before we get into it, I just want to just remind you and maybe explain if you've never heard before the reason that we do uh, things like this. And there's just a few. One of them is that this is something that Jesus commands his disciples to do. So Jesus commanded in, in Matthew 28 uh, for his disciples to go and uh, spread the gospel, to teach people about Jesus, and to baptize, to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So we do this simply as, as an act of faith, as an act of trust, as an act of obedience uh, to the command of Jesus. The, the other reason we do this is that the very act of baptism portrays the gospel. So you're going to hear the gospel later with words, but before we hear the gospel with words, you're actually going to see it on display as, as Gracie and, and Noah go down into the water and come up out of the water alive. It reminds us of the... It's going to be all right. Yeah. It reminds us of how Jesus went down into death and was raised to newness of life. And so one of the reasons that Jesus commands his disciples to do this is, it, is because it portrays what Jesus has done, and that by faith, this person is joining Jesus, is joining him in his death, and joining him in his resurrection as a follower of Jesus, made new with a, a new heart that Jesus has given them. The another reason we do this is that it tells the church, and it tells the world, that the person being baptized is a follower of Jesus. That whether that when a person decides to do this as a disciple of Jesus, it, it tells the church and it tells the world, I'm a follower of Jesus now, and I love Jesus, and I trust Jesus to have saved me from my sins. Another reason that we do it is that it tells other believers that the person being baptized loves them and wants to minister with them. So the person who is, is doing this today is not just saying something about them and Jesus, they're saying something about them and the body of Christ, other believers in Jesus. So that's another reason we do it. And then the last reason we do it is that it functionally calls others to believe. That as the gospel is portrayed, you are being called to believe in and trust in this same gospel that the person being baptized has trusted in. And so that's why we do this. And we trust that Jesus is uniquely present with us as we obey him uh, in these ways. And so first up is my friend Gracie. Now Gracie, why don't you come on up here and stand with me. Gracie is going to share a verse that is special to her. But before she does that, uh, I just want to tell you guys a little bit about my experience with Gracie. So Gracie started to express some interest in doing this as a follower of Jesus. And so she suffered through three classes with me and like a champ while well, we talked about this and what it means and what the Bible says about this. And all through it and before it and afterwards, um, I, I have to say, I haven't met many young ladies with as much initiative as Gracie uh, has. She has very eagerly desired to do this and understands uh, what she is saying here this morning about being a follower of Jesus and wanting to follow Jesus with her whole heart. And so be praying for Gracie as she walks this path and as she uh, goes from here and follows Jesus. So Gracie, are you ready to share the verse with the congregation now that you love so much? Okay, go ahead. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians 4.13.
So Gracie, I'm going to ask you those questions we talked about. And the first one is about God. So Gracie, do you believe that God is your creator and that he loves you and that he made you to enjoy him forever and he is good and he is holy and he is righteous and he is perfect and he is true and he made you to enjoy him forever. Do you believe that? Now, Gracie, this is the hard one, but we've talked about this. Do you also believe that you haven't honored or worshiped God as he deserves and that you, just like everybody else, is a sinner and deserves actually not God's salvation, but God's judgment for sin. And, and you can't do anything to save yourself. Do you believe that? Now, here's the good news, right? Gracie, are you trusting today in Jesus Christ to do for yourself what you cannot do to save you from your sin, to forgive you, to give you a new heart, and to make you able to follow Jesus and trust him everything in you. Do you believe that? Gracie, are you hoping one day with confidence in Christ that you're going to see him face to face and live with him forever and be happy forever with him? Do you believe that? No. Okay. Praise God. Well, Gracie, because of your confession of faith today, it's my pleasure to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son. I'm really excited today because I get to baptize uh, my firstborn son here, uh, Noah, and uh, he uh, came and talked to me, I don't know, I suppose a month or two ago, um, and said, you know what, I, I want to get baptized now, and, and the reason it was is because we have these booklets back there, and here's one of them, why should I be baptized? So I didn't even know he did this, just of his own volition, he, he picked this up, he read it, and for the first time he realized that being baptized was actually a command. He's like, I never realized that was actually something that I was commanded to do. And I, I'm proud of him, and I appreciate that it was really that simple for him, that if my Lord Jesus is telling me to do something, I'm going to do it, even if it requires me <laughs> standing in front of people and getting soaking wet in front of people, right? And so um, I'm very proud because I know that sometimes uh, there's reasons why we're just not comfortable doing this, and, and Noah's no different, but he believes in following the Lord, and so he's done that. Um, one of the other things that we uh, chatted about just this weekend is I asked Noah if he, if someone came and asked him, why do you believe in Jesus, or why do you believe the gospel, what, what would you say? And um, he's, the first thing he said was, well, because it was the way I, I was raised, and I said, well, uh, be more specific, and... Um, it's maybe a little bit weird saying this, I guess, because it's about me. <laughs> but I didn't know this, actually, until we had this discussion. Um, it was this just the other day, I think. Uh, he said, well, actually, what's been most impactful, is, Dad, is having heard your testimony so many times. So um, over the years, we've had countless, countless people over to our home um, to share a, a, an evening with us. And often we do that. We share testimonies. And... And it, it turns out that your kids listen <laughs> when you're doing that. Um, and so he mentioned that as, as being very impactful. Um, so that makes it, me all the more glad uh, for this day. Uh, Noah wanted me to share uh, this verse with you, 2 Timothy 1, uh, 7 and 8. Uh, for God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord nor of me his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Alright, no, 
know, so I'm going to ask you a few questions here. You have to take your glasses off first. Uh, Noah, uh, do you believe in God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that God is good and holy, and that he loves you as your good dad in heaven? Yes. And Noah, do you believe that you are sinful, that you've done bad things, that you've broken God's law, and that for this you deserve to be judged, and that there's nothing you can do on your own to make up for that debt, that, that God has to do something to make it right? And do you believe that God has done something to make you right with him, that he sent his son to live in your place, to die in your place, and that when he died on a cross, he died for your sin, and when he rose to new life, he was saying, you can have new life with God. Yes. And is this your hope, that one day you will be with Jesus away from all of this that is wrong and bad, that sin will one day be fully forgiven and be snuffed out completely, and that for eternity you will have the joy of having God as your father? Yes. Well, based on your profession, based on the finished work of Christ and what he's done to baptize you with Christ in baptism, I now baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. gospel has now been portrayed in the presence of you all, and the gospel demands a response. From the believer, it demands a response of gratitude and praise. Thank you. Thank you, God, for making us the objects of your grace and mercy, and, and the response of everyone else should be, I want that too. I want to be the object of God's grace. I want to be the object of God's mercy, and, and the portrayal of of the news that this can only be found in Christ calls you to account right now. You will not be able to get to the end of your days and say to God, I didn't know. Now you know. And so flee to Christ and run to Christ and trust in Christ for he has sent his son so that you can come. Let's pray and then we're going to continue to sing. Our Father in God, we thank you for the testimony of your son his death for our sake, his life for our life. And we thank you for being a loving father, a good father who, who will not overlook injustice and evil, and yet who will rescue and save those who trust in your one and only son. So move our hearts now to call on Christ in praise and in faith. In Jesus' name. So at this time, we're going to continue to sing. We're going to continue to worship. This is also the point in the service where, as, as members and regular attenders, we, we give our gifts of, of offering. We give our tithes. If you're a guest here, we have no expectations on you to give. You are our guest. Thank you for being here. Enjoy being with the Lord's people today. But for those of you who are members and regular attenders, uh, we invite you to continue worshiping God as you give. As you're ready, when you're ready to join us in singing, we can, we can stand and sing. How great the chasm that lay between us, how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation. Turn to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God 
Children may come up for the children's sermon. So today, Pastor Corey is talking about Genesis 38, and usually that means that the children's sermon uh, would be about Genesis 38, but instead I wanted to talk about something I saw this week that I thought was really cool. Um, this week, my wife and I were out looking at the stars, and do you know what we saw? We saw one of these and one of these. We saw a big cup and a little cup. Do you think we saw a big cup and a little cup when we looked up in the sky? No? Do you think we saw some cups in the sky? Well, uh, not exactly. Uh, there are actually cups in the sky, but they aren't like these. They are constellations. We call them uh, dippers. So here you got them. You got the big dipper and the little dipper. Okay? So God made two of these and positioned them right next to each other. So it looks like one of them is pouring into the other one. Uh, the big dipper is 30 or 83 light years across and a light year is six trillion 
miles. So the Big Dipper is about 500 trillion miles. Okay, that's the proper face to make. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's a, you can't even comprehend actually that number. If you took 250 round trips from Earth to the sun and back, that's the distance that the Big Dipper is. Okay, so it's huge. So anyways, God put these huge cups in the sky uh, right next to each other, and it reminded me of a few verses. Uh, one was Psalm 19, 1 through 2, which says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. And then Romans 1.20 came to mind, God's invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that he has made. So when I look at something as common as the Little and Big Dipper, I realize how silly people can be. Uh, first, we can get so used to things that are so amazing, we call them common. We say, oh yeah, that's just the Big Dipper. It's 500 trillion, trillion miles across, no biggie. Oh yeah, and that's the Little Dipper, and they both look like cups, and one is pouring into the other. No biggie. Uh, we have this weird condition where we stop seeing glory. We stop seeing beauty in the world. It doesn't seem to actually register. Uh, second, we have a bigger problem. Uh, the dippers are speaking a really loud message. We are made. We were created by a powerful God to tell you about him. See his power. See his divinity in us. When I look up at it, it's an obvious message if I'm listening. Unfortunately, a lot of people are really, really good at avoiding the message. In the same way we don't see glory in the Big Dipper, we don't see the glory of God in the Big Dipper. The same way we can be glory blind to the beauty of the world around us, we can be gl uh, glory blind to the power of the great God who made the beauty of the world around us. So God is not hidden, okay? He's not hard to find or to see. Evidence for him leaps out at us all the time, every day, everywhere. Uh, but because humans are really, really good at not seeing glory, we can grow up and say really silly things like, where's the evidence of God? <laughs> and I would say, stop being so dense, right? Have you seen the dippers, right? Oh, those are just stars. No, they are not just stars. They're stars arranged in patterns so specific that you would never see it happen by chance even once, and God made it happen twice right next to each other to say, stop being so silly, look up, I'm obvious. Uh, God's messages are clear. All we need to do is open our eyes and open our ears and listen. All right, let's pray. Uh, Father God, I thank you uh, first and foremost for these kids and the things that they get to learn at this church, and a lot of those things are in seed form right now, and as they hear repetitious lessons, that knowledge and understanding is going to grow. And so, Father, through the nature class uh, that we did this uh, summer and through messages like this, I pray, Lord, that uh, their eyes and their ears and their senses would really just be ripped open to the glory that's in the world, to the glory that points to you, Father. You made all of these things to reflect who you are and your power and so, Father, uh, help them to see. Send your Holy Spirit to open their eyes and their ears and give them hearts that receive the beauty and the truth that you've embedded in everything from the stars to the grass to the puppy dogs to the person that they are that they see in the mirror. And, Father, I pray for all of the adults here as well, God, that, that we would not go through life just staring at glowing rectangles and... Um, just constantly absorbed into something that isn't real and just constantly absorbed into social media or TV or all of these things that really help us avoid your glory in creation. Uh, God, help us to have eyes to see. Help, help us to have senses to receive just how amazing you are and to see that through this world. And we ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen.
Well, if you have your Bibles, I'd invite you to turn in them to the book of Genesis, chapter 38. As we, we're continuing, we're just going to keep on going through our series uh, in Genesis that we resumed last week. So last week was chapter 37 about Joseph and, and his brothers selling him into slavery in Egypt. And uh, that brings us to chapter 38, and it feels like an interruption to the Joseph story. It's not, and I'm going to try to show you why it's not. Uh, as we go through it, um, but I got to tell you, like just just up front, this chapter is wild. And I mean, if you if you got the newsletter, you hopefully you read it in advance. And if you did read it in advance, or you even glance at the content of it, you might wonder, with all the mature content in it, why I would preach on it at all, uh, especially in mixed company. So let me start, actually, by giving you five quick reasons why I cannot avoid this passage and why we're just going to keep on trucking through Genesis and why I would preach on this uh, chapter, even in mixed company. First of all, I am going to read from the New American Standard, and that tames it down a bit, makes it a little bit more appropriate for multiple ages. But in any case, let me give you five reasons why Uh, we would not want to avoid passages like this. First of all, I trust that all of Scripture is profitable. I trust that all of Scripture is profitable. And so when we just do this, when we systematically work through books of the Bible bit by bit, we are trusting the Holy Spirit to speak in and through all of His Word. And frequently, if if we just stick to books of the Bible chapter by chapter, then the Holy Spirit will even speak in ways that we couldn't have planned on ourselves. So it's an act of trust in the Holy Spirit to speak, even when the passage is hard. Uh, Second, there's an advantage to parents, and there's an advantage to children if they hear and read passages like this. So here's the reality. Here's the reality. Our kids will hear about matters that are far more explicit than what's in Genesis 38 sooner or later. I've known kindergartners that hear about stuff far worse than this on the school playground. And so they are going to hear, they are going to hear things far worse. But if the first place that our our kids hear about things like this is from the Bible, in a church, sitting with a parent or a grandparent, then you have an advantage that not many other parents or grandparents have. And your kids have an advantage that few children have today. Hearing about these things in church first, rather than in the world, puts you ahead of many, many other people. Third reason. The third reason we don't avoid passages like this with its with their mature content, is that there is a cost to our shyness and embarrassment about these subjects. Shyness or embarrassment about these subjects, actually, it just increases our children's curiosity about these things while simultaneously discrediting us as sources of information. If, if we are embarrassed or shy about these subjects, then our kids will not come to us to talk about them. Our shyness will cost us our kids' trust. Fourth, God made parents and grandparents to help kids understand these very things. This is what parents and grandparents are for. If kids have hard questions after reading things like this in the Bible, then that's a good thing because that's what God put you in their life for. That's what he's made you for. And if he made you for this, then he will equip you to teach your children about it. And then finally, final reason we would not avoid a passage like this is that it's got a good message. There's a good message in this passage. We don't want to avoid it because the because of the quality of its message. This is a message for messy families. This is a message for messy families. Therefore, it's a message for every family because every family is messy. So let me get into it first by reading the first 11 verses of the story, and then I want to pray. So this is Genesis 38, starting at verse 1. This is God's word. 
And it came about at that time, remember, that's the time that they shuffled Joseph off into slavery. And it came about at that time that Judah departed from his brothers and visited a certain Adulamite whose name was Hira. Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua, and he took her as a wife and had relations with her. And she conceived and gave birth to a son, and he named him Ur. Then she conceived again and gave birth to a son, and she named him Onan. She gave birth to yet another son, and she named him Shelah. And it was at Kezib that she gave birth to him. Now Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was evil in the sight of the Lord, so the Lord took his life. Then Judah said to Onan, Have relations with your brother's wife and perform your duty as a brother-in-law to her and raise up a child for your brother. Now Onan knew that the child would not be his, so when he had relations with his brother's wife, he wasted his seed on the ground so that he would not give a child to his brother. But what he did was displeasing in the sight of the Lord, so he took his life also. Then Judah said to his daughter-in-law Tamar, Remain a widow in your father's house until my son Shelah grows up, for he thought, I'm afraid that he too may die like his brothers. So Tamar went and lived in her father's house. All right, let's pray. Our Father and God, we pray in a story like this with a messy family that we would, uh, that we would take seriously uh, the words that are in it. That we wouldn't gloss over them or shrink from them, but we would rather see what you have for us in it. God, we trust that all your word is profitable and that uh, there are things that you're going to do with this text that we couldn't have planned on. And so we entrust ourselves to you in this moment. Ask your blessing. Ask for the presence of Christ. Ask for the fullness of the Spirit and ask that we would respond well to the picture of you in this passage. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the point I want to argue from this passage is simply this, that God makes a name for himself in messy families. That God makes a name for himself in messy families is the main point I want to argue from this passage. Heaven will not be an experience where we literally forget what a mess we were. Rather, it will be an experience where we marvel at the goodness and the glory of God in what he accomplished through our messes and sins and shortcomings. God will make a name for himself that we will enjoy for eternity not because we have literally no memory of our messes, but because we marvel at his grace and his power in our messes. Now, obviously, the main emphasis of this chapter is on how God is doing this very thing with one family in particular, Judah's family, but I think we're going to be able to draw some implications for ourselves along the way. So I see three ways that God is making a name for himself in this messed up family, and so that's what I want to show you today. Three ways that God is making a name for himself in this messed up family, and then we'll end with some application. So first thing, first God is making a name for himself here in this messy family by number one, bringing sin to light through surprising circumstances. The first way God is making a name for himself in this messy family is by bringing sin to light through surprising circumstances. Let's read more of the story. I want us to see how this comes up. So verse 12, it says, After a considerable time, that's a considerable amount of time that Tamar was a widow in her father's house. After a considerable time, Shua's daughter, the wife of Judah, died. And when the time of mourning was ended, Judah went up to the sheep shearers at Timnah. He and his friend Hira the Adulamite. And Tamar was told, Behold, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep. So she removed her widow's garments and covered herself with a veil and wrapped herself and sat in the gateway of Anim, which is on the road to Timnah. For she saw that Shelah had grown up and she had not been given to him as a wife. When Judah saw her, he assumed she was a prostitute, for she had covered her face. So he turned aside to her by the road and said, Here now, let me have relations with you. For he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. And she said, what will you give me that you may have relations with me? He said, therefore, I will send you a young goat from the flock. She then said, will you give a pledge until you send it? 
He said, what pledge shall I give you? And she said, your seal and your cord and your staff that is in your hand. So he gave them to her and had relations with her, and she conceived by him. Then she got up and departed and removed her veil and put on her widow's garments. When Judah sent the young goat by his friend the Adulamite to receive the pledge from the woman's hand, he did not find her. He asked the people of her place, saying, Where is the temple prostitute who was by the road at Anim? But they said, There has been no temple prostitute here. So he returned to Judah and said, I did not find her. And furthermore, the people of the place said, There has been no temple prostitute here. Then Judah said, Let her keep them, otherwise we will become a laughingstock. After all, I sent this young goat, but you did not find her. Now, it was about three months later that Judah was informed, Your daughter-in-law, Tamar, has prostituted herself, and behold, she's also pregnant by prostitution. Then Judah said, Bring her out and have her burned. It was while she was being brought out that she sent word to her father-in-law, saying, I am pregnant by the man to whom these things belong. And she also said, Please examine and see whose signet ring and cords and staff are these. And Judah recognized them and said, She is more righteous than I, since I did not give her to my son Shelah, and he did not have relations with her again. So again, the point here is that God is making a name for himself that we will enjoy for eternity by bringing one family's sins up to the surface, especially the sins of the father Judah. I want you to notice that the center of the drama in this passage is that Tamar is the stereotypically immoral one, right? She commits what seems to be the most obvious and serious sin, but it's Judah that the passage actually confronts. The drama orbits around Judah being exposed, not Tamar. Notice first how Judah is exposed as a deceiver. You might remember from chapter 30, 37 that it was particularly Judah's idea to sell his brother Joseph into slavery. And then he deceives his father and fakes the death of, Judah, uh, fakes the death of Joseph. And now Judah, the one who deceived his father, is being deceived by Tamar's actions, right? It's a very confrontational turn of events that directly confronts Judah's own deceptive character. Next, when Judah plays the part of the righteous one who is scandalized by Tamar's immorality, he actually turns out to be the one who is exposed as not only immoral, but a hypocrite also. He, he's exposed as a self-righteous hypocrite, which is why he says of Tamar, she is more righteous than I. You should just think about what a stunning confrontation this is. Next to the one who prostituted herself, Judah seems less righteous. Certainly didn't think of himself that way at first circumstances that God uses to bring his sin to light make him realize, no, I'm the far more unrighteous one here. Major point of this story seems to be that many times God will use the sin of one to confront the greater sins of another. In other words, though Tamar's actions are her own, and an argument could be made that she should have done things differently, and while all sin is truly sinful, God uses Tamar's actions here to confront Judah's far more heinous and serious sins. Now, it doesn't happen yet, but this is one thing that I think sets Judah up to finally break down years later and repent. It can be hard to see what this story is doing here, just dropped right into the middle of the Joseph story. It feels like an interruption. But it makes sense when you think about how God is preparing Judah for the day years later where he's going to have to face a test of his own heart right in front of the brother he sold into slavery. And the options before him will be to repent or to continue with his deceptive character. And you'll see in chapter 44, he repents. 
gives himself over to the mercy of God. I think this event here is setting him up for that day in the way the circumstances confront him and bring his sin to light. And so I think the lesson here is that God often ordains hard and even surprising circumstances to bring us to repentance, circumstances he intends to soften us and turn us from trusting in false shelters and false justifications and false senses of righteousness and instead turn and trust God alone who gives righteousness. This is different, by the way, than God pouring out his wrath on you. Wrath would actually look like God just, just letting you go unchallenged by any circumstances, whatever, and never having to reflect on ways in which you might not be turning to him in greater trust and dependence. Circumstances are hard many times intentionally to soften us and turn us. I've had this happen in a very small way recently. I was getting irritated one particular day about how many things were interrupting my plans and demanding my time in unexpected ways. And, and while fuming about this in the car, I decided to listen to C.S. Lewis's screw tape letters. I've been listening to Lewis's screw tape letters in the car on the way to and from the office recently. And so it just, it just so happened as I was driving from one inconvenient interruption to another, I found myself in the part of the book talking about how one great trick of the devil on us is to make us assume that we start each day, quote, as the lawful possessor of 24 hours. And that all the time we're given comes to us as our very own personal birthright and not as pure gift. How we would never think that we can put the sun and moon under our subjection, but for some reason we think our time belongs to us. As a gentle reminder from the Lord that oftentimes our hard circumstances exist because we're meant to be alerted to our shortcomings and alerted to our sins. And he, he does this by making himself known. He does this because he wants to make himself known as a kind and attentive father. Understand this, that when your sins are brought to light because of unusual or hard circumstances, it is the kindness of a God who is making a name for himself that you will enjoy for eternity. That's number one. The second way, these get shorter as we go, but the second way God makes a name for himself in this messy family is by ensuring that his plans will not be set aside. He's making a name for himself in this messy family by ensuring that his plans will not be set aside. Let's read the end of the story, starting in verse 27. It came about at that time that she was giving birth. Behold, there were twins in her womb. Moreover, it took place while she was giving birth that one baby put out a hand, and the midwife took and tied a scarlet thread on his hand, saying, This one came out first. But it came about as he drew back his hand that, behold, his brother came out. And then she said, what a breach you've made for yourself. So he was named Perez. Afterward, his brother came out who had the scarlet thread on his hand, and he was named Zara. Now, uh, let me explain why the story of the birth of Tamar's sons illustrates this point, that God's plans cannot be set aside. So, first of all, I'm borrowing this phrase, God's plans not being set aside. That's vocabulary from a, from a book by Alan Ross. And uh, Alan Ross, in his book on Genesis, uh, points out something significant about the birth of these two boys and how it connects to the Joseph story. So here's another connection to the Joseph story. Now, remember Joseph's story. God has chosen Joseph to rule. God has chosen Joseph to have supremacy and primacy and prominence and authority over his older brothers. That's what God has chosen for Joseph. And his brothers didn't like it. And that's why they sold him into slavery. Joseph is the young one. Joseph is the baby brother. He should be answering to us, And so they sell him into slavery, and Judah thinks that he and his brothers have successfully set God's plans 
aside. But then, Judah has two sons. Two sons he never planned on having. And as they're being born, the younger one triumphs over the older one in their birth. The younger one gains prominence. It's as if the birth of these boys here to Judah is God's way of hinting at the reality that Judah's own plans for his younger brother are not going to be set aside either. If God wants the younger to rule, then the, that's the way it's going to be. And no matter what Judah thinks he's accomplished, it is God's plans that will prevail. Now, besides that, notice also how Judah's plans really do seem to endanger God's plans for this family and by extension the world with two sons dead and only one remaining and no wife for that last son Judah's line is in danger of being extinguished so Judah's actions are endangering God's plans for this family and Tamar's are the ones that save it as messy as and imperfect as they are now, what you have to understand here is that, yes, there are a lot of ordinary messes going on in this family, but at the same time, this is not an ordinary family. What seem like very local problems for this family actually have cosmic implications. For example, you may have wondered, why was it such a big deal for Onan to do what he did in verse 9? Right? Why was it such a big deal for Onan to do what he did in verse 9. Why would God put him to death over that? Why is it such a big deal for Judah's line to continue? Well, the big deal goes all the way back to Genesis 3.15. And in Genesis 3.15, God explains to Eve and to the serpent that his plan to save the world was going to take place through the seed of the woman. In other words, having babies was the way that God was going to save the world. From the woman would come a seed or an offspring that was going to fully and finally reverse the curse and crush the serpent, a savior. And so an active decision to waste seed was a decision to not participate in God's plan for the world, to save the world. It was to oppose God himself. It was to go against his plan to bring a savior into the world. And so that's what I mean by local problems with cosmic implications, cosmic significance. And you can actually see this very drama play out through the whole story of the Bible. Uh, we, we're not going to go there for the sake of time, but in Revelation 12, this is beautifully described, this drama over the course of biblical history. The whole story of the Bible is summarized in Revelation 12 as a battle between the seed of the woman, the Messiah, and the serpent. And how the activity of the serpent all throughout the Old Testament was to keep that seed that would crush him one day from being born. And so whether it's here in chapter 38, or it's Pharaoh killing babies in Egypt in Exodus, or whether it's Jezebel and Ahab endorsing child sacrifice under Baal, whether it's Haman trying to extinguish the Jews in Esther, or whether it's Herod slaughtering babies in Bethlehem, Behind the scenes is always the serpent trying to extinguish the seed of the woman that God promised would put the serpent under his heel. But God's plans are not easily set aside. And they're not easily set aside because the plan was to save the world and to bring his son into it miraculously and to have him live as we should have lived and to have him die for our sins and to have him conquer death and destroy the devil and no power in heaven or on earth, let alone a Hebrew shepherd could put a stop to it. No power in heaven or earth can stop God from accomplishing his plans. And you need to remember that every election year and every time you read the news and during every hard season and during every hard loss. This is what my friend Andrew told us at his daughter's funeral. God has a plan to save his people 
And every hard thing fits into that plan and cannot stop him from saving his people. God is making all things new and nothing, nothing will stop him. And so God makes a name for himself as the God whose plans cannot be set aside. Next and briefly, we see God making a name for himself by accomplishing plans that reverse our human standards. So not only does he keep his plans, those plans reverse our human standards. As we've already seen in God's economy, he delights to elevate the lowly younger brother and humble the exalted older brother. You know, maybe that dynamic we don't see play out as much in modern families in, in our own culture. And even if we do, it probably doesn't occur to the same degree that it occurs in, in this ancient Near Eastern culture, but you understand that back then, I mean, to be the firstborn, it was to have the prominence, it was to have the authority, it was to have the double share of the inheritance, it was a big deal. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with it, but the way that God likes to work is that he doesn't want our standards, and he doesn't want our status to be our source of righteousness to be our occasion for boasting. He, he knows that anything other than himself as a source of righteousness and a source of boasting will not ultimately satisfy us and not ultimately do. And so God is constantly stripping these things from the ones he loves and reversing these things so that we would rest in him and boast in him rather than find some false shelter in being important in the world's eyes. That's what God that's what God is doing with Judah. That's one way we see our human standards reversed in the passage. Another way God reverses human standards is how Tamar is portrayed. Tamar, the probably Canaanite woman, the foreigner who assumes the role of a prostitute and yet is proven to be more righteous than the upstanding Judah. So even though King David will descend from Judah and Jesus himself will descend from Judah, it will be because of what Tamar did. And in her company are also women like Rahab, who was an actual prostitute, and, and Ruth, who was a, a foreigner, an outcast, and Bathsheba, and lots of other names that are surprising to find on a list of Jesus' relatives. Tamar is on a list of a lot of other least likely players to be called onto the field to play the game. This, of course, is because Jesus himself would be the most unlikely servant of God. Jesus would be the surprising hero. No form or majesty that we should esteem him. Rather, he would look stricken and rejected by God himself. The king who would take his throne not with a sword, but with a cross instead. So that we would praise God that he doesn't play by our rules. Our rules would have ended us. Our plans would have ended in everlasting despair, but instead God has brought our sin to light and executed it at the cross of his son. And he's kept his plans, and because he's kept his plans, we know he will keep his people. And he has put every spiritual power and every human standard to shame at the cross of his son. And this he has done for our joy forever. So, how do we respond to this news? God will bring our sins to light, but it is because of his kindness to make a name for himself, as kind and patient, that he keeps his plans, that he reverses our standards. How should we respond in light of what God is doing in this incredibly messy family? Here's my first idea. We should be merciless to our own mess. We should be merciless to our own mess. I, I'm sure that to some degree we can all relate to having messy families. And we usually think that the worst days are the days when everyone else's messes just keep coming up all over the place. Everyone else's issues just keep erupting like a volcano and, and troubling everyone else. But you know, I think the worst days are actually when we think we know exactly what everyone else's problems are. And we tell them exactly what their problems are while we remain inattentive to our own. 
the reality is that your family has no reason to repent if you don't. Your family has no reason to obey the Lord if you don't. Sin in your family cannot be dealt with by overlooking your own. It's not a good plan. Being merciless to your own sin is a much better plan. So the husbands and fathers that resent how their, how their wives and children won't submit to them. You ever feel that? The no, Bible says I'm the head of the house. How about a little respect around here? Show them how to do it. Show them how to do it. You don't feel it? Show them how to do it. Show them how to, show them how to submit to God. Show them how to obey the Lord. Show them that you can follow too. Show your wives and children how to submit by submitting yourself to God. The wives and mothers who resent how their husbands are inattentive and distant, show them how by paying attention to God's commands to respect your husband and to build up rather than tear down. Don't nag and, and criticize. Praise them for the little things. Honor and respect them. There are a lot of warnings in the Bible, as it turns out, about accusing people of doing the very same things that you're doing. Be merciless to your own mess. Get under your own car hood before opening up your neighbors. Or as Jesus said, take the log out of your own eye. Then you'll see clearly to take the log out of your brothers. That's the, that's the first takeaway. Your, your family with all the things they do to bother you has no real reason to deal with their mess if you don't deal with yours. A second idea, you got to hear this, is that only the gospel is able to do anything with your mess. Only the gospel is able to do anything with your mess. So don't walk away from that last point with an exceptional American can-do attitude. That would just create a whole other problem. Uh, for example, sometimes... It may legitimately not be a problem for us to see where we fall short. Sometimes we're not blind to our own shortcomings and, and our own messes and our own sins. The, the mess of our sins can sometimes dawn on us rather quickly, right? Like when you move the trash can off the bathroom floor, right? And there's just that perfect little shape of the color the floor used to be, right? Testifying to you and to all your guests how your floor is really dirty because that's the color... That's the color that it used to look like. That's the color that it should be. Sometimes our sins are as obvious to us as that. There's just no denying it. It's right, it's, it's right there. We do have those moments. And so at that moment, the problem comes in, not in our blindness. The problem comes in in what we think is going to clean up the mess. The problem comes in not that we don't see the mess, but what we think is actually going to clean it up. We often try the special cleanser of try harder or maybe add some more rules or make a new resolution and maybe that chemical will do the trick. And we spread that cleanser into every corner of that bathroom floor, scrubbing with all of our might, and what do we find? We find that we just rearranged the filth find actually that the filth is spread into the one clean corner of the bathroom where the trash can used to be, and we've decorated it in a new shade of muck. It doesn't work. It's the gospel that has to get into every corner. It's the good news of Jesus. The good news is you can't get the floor clean. You can't give yourself a new heart. You can't change your desires. You can't erase your sin. You can't impress God. You can't purchase heaven. You can't rise from the dead. But Jesus can, and Jesus did. Jesus did it all. And he calls you now to surrender and believe and turn and trust and worship and see him and love him for who he is. And that changes everything. That changes everything. Only the gospel of Jesus, crucified and risen for you, will ever do anything about your mess. Finally, this is for us, church. Be comforted that God is making a name for himself, not just in messy families, but in messy churches too. Just as the circumstances of a Christian's life are meant by God to bring sin to light and 
magnify his plans and reverse our standards and drive us to repentance and greater dependence on the Lord, so are the circumstances that the Lord brings into the life of his churches. Nothing this church has been through in the last nine years occurred outside of the Lord's plans for it. And every hard thing is driving us to practice repentance and confession of sin and humble evangelism and brotherly love and joyful gospel proclamation and total confidence in God and in God alone. Let's pray. Father and God, we thank you and praise you for your grace to us as a church, as a people, for the love and power of your Son. We commit ourselves to him now in faith as we sing, as we praise. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. All right. Well, um, we got lunch next, so I want to pray for our lunch. Um, And there is actually, there's even some pizza on the way just to make sure that we've got enough for everybody. So um, we invite you to linger for our lunch meeting and fellowship with us. Let me pray for that and then we'll dismiss with a word from the Lord. God, we thank you for the food that you provide. We thank you for your grace in providing it. Uh, We pray for your blessing on our meeting and in our fellowship before that meeting as we enjoy these good and gracious gifts from your hand. God, we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, all right, all right. So the word from the Lord today to send us into fellowship and to send us into the world is from Romans 6, 8. It says, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So, here's the charge. You also must consider yourselves dead to sin alive to God in Christ Jesus. God bless you as you go.